Um, hello all. I'm sorry I can't be there in person. Thank you for allowing me to join you virtually. Um, it's always dangerous being the last speaker on a panel with smart, such smart people because they've taken all the good stuff. Um, so I could just at this point say thanks and walk away or show you the pretty slides. But as I was listening and as I was thinking, as I was hearing about this, and I apologize that I haven't been here, so this could be talked about a lot throughout the conference, but I think it's important for us to, to realize that when we talk about AI and librarianship, I think it's a great potential boon, but I think the boon is not in reifying the stuff that we've done, but in helping to change us to what we should do. Um, particularly in the idea of academic settings and academic libraries, we need to stop talking about users because we don't have users. We have faculty and staff and students and learners and discoverers and explorers and scholars. We have people that don't just want to consume information or use a system, but people who want to advance knowledge. We're talking about how we can understand and interpret things in different ways. And so we need to begin to start thinking about communities and we begin to need, we need to begin to think about different frameworks so that I've been asked today to speak about competencies of librarians and what kinds of things do librarians need to know. But I want to start a little bit by giving a perspective on what I mean by a librarian. Because to me, the systems that we have, the collections that we have, the buildings that we have, the licenses that we pay for, all of those things are excellent, excellent tools to the real center and value that librarians bring, which is human-to-human -human contact connection and sense-making. What we have is the ability to help communities get better, to understand the mission that they're on and interpret things in different ways. And a lot of the concepts that we may be trying to hold on to are concepts that came from a very different time, a time of scarcity. A time of scarcity when books and materials were scarce and expensive, then of course that went away. But now we live in a time where attention is scarce, where our ability to pay attention and to spend time and think of things, that was always the time effort. And so what AI, and particularly generative AI, is they can begin to solve some of the scarcity issues. They can begin looking at tools to help us be more productive to analyze data in different ways, to analyze data at a scale we had never thought about. Um, and it takes that new thinking to move into this dimension. If we continually think of the library as the building and the collections and the things that are asked for, and not as a vital function of understanding and meaning making within our universities and our colleges, we are going to miss a great opportunity. Um, and so we need to shift perspective. So I'm going to talk about competencies toward the end, but I need to start by talking about a shift in perspective. Because if we're going to talk about what librarians can do in AI or what AI is going to do to librarians, we better come up with a good definition of what a librarian is. And that might seem obvious, but I'm going to argue it's not. So first, the obvious, the things that you've heard already, so I won't spend too much time on it. It is not that AI is coming. It is not that we need to prepare for AI. It is not that AI needs to be planned for, strategized, etc. AI is here, and it has been here. If you have used a search engine, if you have used social media, you have used AI. If you've used it to keep track of health and walking around and knowing how many steps are taking, you've used AI. If you have listened to music through Spotify or Apple Music or anything else and your musical taste is being influenced already by AI, even the systems that Marshall just went through, while they may not explicitly call AI, there is increasing use of machine learning and Bayesian technology. So sometimes even the next thing you're looking at comes from AI. We're seeing that universities are using data to, uh, in, to look at enrollment data, to look at which programs get built and which ones close down. We're looking at the idea of analyzing intellectual impact through citation and citation patterns, citation patterns, etc. All of this is increasingly being brought around AI. University of Texas, we live and die by Google Scholar profiles. AI, in terms of finding our documents and knowing which ones are duplicates and which ones are the same, etc. So we're already there. We know that they're coming to our collections. 
I'm writing a book right now. Congratulations on me. And I'm using AI to do it. Now, it's my book, it's my words, I stand by it, but when I get stuck for how to phrase something or what the next way to think about something is, I plug it into ChatGPT and see where it's going. And so therefore it is already helping the research process. I'm on a research team with two other scholars and a group of doctoral students. We were looking at can we study the reference function and reference AI? We kept talking about how we could do this, et cetera, et cetera. And one of my research partners kept saying, but what's the research question? And we go around, but what's the research question? And we go around, what's the research question? And then he was quiet. And two minutes later, he said, um, could Lemon let me share the screen on Zoom? I think we're out of a job. And he brought up ChatGPT. What are the research questions about parameter, parameter, parameter? And it was a really good research statement. Now, it's not the research, it's not the data, it doesn't have the ability to evaluate that it's good, but it certainly moved the conversation forward. We're there already. We're looking at AI-generated text. We already have generated uh, AI-generated images and book covers and marketing materials and chatbots pushing different materials upon us to read it. We're there. Now, we need to assess these systems. We need to figure out where they work and where they don't and how they're hallucinating, and we do that on a regular basis, yes. But the answers to those questions are in great flux. I would just like us to take a moment to realize that ChatGPT that I think sparked the conversation, once again, not the first or only system, but the one that got sort of captured attention, was 11 months ago, not even a year. And we're already talking about how it's changing industries, including ours. That, what's happened in that 11 months, besides people making images like this on the slide, is we've also looked at, for example, in the United States, we already have the idea that AI-generated materials cannot be put under copyright, that you need human agency, and therefore anything that comes out of these systems is in the public domain, which makes it probably the second largest generator of material for the public domain after the U.S. government itself. And it's going to be an interesting legal question. Um, Marshall mentioned the idea of building our own AI systems, and I think that's great, but I question where the text will come from. Because right now what we know is, well, it's not really that much of a black box. We know that a lot of ChatGPT and their large language models are being built around not only what they can scrape off the internet, but massive sets of pirated full text eBooks. We know that there is a huge amount of content that is coming from highly curated, highly thought through, highly funded human generation. Books, reporting, um, news media, that's all coming into these systems. And there's been studies out of the University of Washington and out of California that said once you begin to remove these copyrighted materials, suddenly the capabilities of these systems go down, down, down. I think the phrase they actually used was sucked bad, which I don't know if that translates into, me in, into Spanish very well. But now we're seeing things like the New York Times coming out with new acceptable use policies where they say thou shalt not farm our materials for AI generation. So we're going to be left with systems that are easy to use and generate systems that look convincing but are based on content that's not very good. And those are the same uh, publishers that if libraries started, and when libraries did start talking about scanning books and leading to that whole group, stopped us in court dead. Right? So if we're hoping that we have these high quality, high content materials and journals and books to bring in through open access, but until open access kicks in, we have the same common cause with the AI builders, not necessarily the publishers of this content. Something to think about. So that's going to make us think in a different way. We know that AI needs to be taught. We need to teach people how to use this. And I think that it's going to be incredible because it's going to allow people to tell stories and share their narratives in ways they have never been able to before. When people didn't have the ability to draw, they can now work on generating content. When I was in Mexico earlier, um, two months ago, a month ago, we were on a panel talking about generative AI and the general consensus of the panel with image generation is that it's going to lead to greater language skills. You have to be more eloquent and clear and grammatically correct to produce images that truly match what's in your mind. So the idea that somehow it's going to erase writing skills, I think is not true. So the point of this is, 
it's here. It's now and it's happening before us. And if what we try and do is fit it in or slot it in the side or treat it like a workshop on Thursday, not only will we be missing an opportunity to talk about what librarians can contribute to this, but we will be self containing ourselves out of currency and out of a great opportunity to reform intellectual property, to reform the publishing industry. If you would like to see open access on steroids, this is an opportunity to make that argument. We can begin to talk about librarians being directly impacted into generating better AI systems, commercial or otherwise. What we have to back to that idea of changing librarians before I say what the competencies are, first we have to recognize that even what we talk about as our core skill has changed. Um, metaphors and librarians about what we do and how we're going to interact with L uh, AI, what skills, etc., comes from the idea of what we do. And so I, 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 they gave me 30 minutes. I'm not going to use it all, so I'm going to take the time to show one of my video clips. I hope this works. Um, this is a clip from a movie called Desk Set. Uh, it was like ob obligatory watching for library students up until about 2000. And it's a uh, movie based with Catherine Hepburn is working in a newspaper as a reference librarian. And Spencer Tracy is a technology expert who comes in and he's trying to build a big computing center within that can answer questions. And what has just happened at this scene opens up is that a reporter has called the computer operator and asked for information on Corfu. Corfu being a uh, country. And the system is not working very well and uh, panic ensues and this interaction occurs. So let's see if this works for us. All right. Oh, it did, clearly did not. Let's see. Oh, okay, I will stop. Thank you for letting me know. It's fabulous. I recommend it. I'll send a link to it. But the bottom line is that <laughs> the bottom line is that um, this is the metaphor is that Catherine Hepburn is about to recite an 80 stanza poem from memory that has only been heard like once in a lifetime. This was the idea that we as librarians knew it all. We were the collection. We were the trivia expert. When someone asked a question, we would get the answer. We could walk through the stacks to the back corner and pull out the book that was perfect. That metaphor doesn't work very well as we began introducing online databases, originally through dial-up and then CD-ROM and eventually through the internet. And then the idea is librarians, we were the people who could search. We could find things. We weren't the people who know it all, but we could find it. And that even didn't work necessarily well because we were always doing something different. But once again, these are metaphors. Then Google and Google popped up. And yes, there were other search engines well before Google and there are some now, but Google really was the one that set this metaphor. And this is where people did t-shirts and you see the famous quotes about Google can bring back 100,000 results and the library and can bring back the four right ones. And we are the search engines. You'll see the, the comic there in the lower right hand corner. And that's not a great metaphor either, right? Because once again, something's happening more than us finding information. And I'm going to argue that we are not going to become chat lib. We're not going to become um, prompt engineers. We're not going to become, because prompt engineering is about a field for about a week and a half. And it's already going away because people realize the whole point of this is human to human interaction. It's conversational, which doesn't just mean the language you use, but it's iterative and goes back and forth. Uh, it builds context as you go, like human beings do. So if we're not these know-it-alls and we're not database searchers and we're not search engines and we're not going to be prompt engineers, what are we? And the answer is we're facilitators. What we do, what we've always done, and I mean 4,000 years always done as librarians is not, and I want to be really clear, is not be judges to what is good information or bad information. It is not to be objective and unbiased, and it never has been. The role of a librarian is to understand the situation of their neighbor, whether that's a faculty member or a student or what have you. 
empathize, create an understanding, dig in deep and take concern and care for this person's success and then use the tools available to them to make that happen. Those tools may be books on a shelf or a database or it may be a search engine or it may be a generative AI system, but they're still new tools. And the, the ability and speed of these tools doesn't matter. For example, when we found out we tried to take library data, MARC data, bibliographic data, and when we looked at what was happening on search engines, we said, why, why, we can fix this. Come look at our good cataloging records. Come look at our data. And Google tried, and Google said, it's too sparse. It's too precise. And worse, it's not connected to anything. You would have, have links and connections and multiple connections for us to determine page rank, relevancy, that idea. And so we never showed up at the top of results, not because we weren't in Google, but because that's not how Google works. And the same is going to be true, ChatGPT. We can't look at Chat, you know, Marshall's right. ChatGPT does a horrible job of cataloging records. But the question isn't how can we make it better at cataloging records? The question is, do we still need to catalog the same way? or at all? Think about this for a moment. The whole idea behind cataloging in a time of physical collections was to create very sparse, very precise records. It was to reduce noise within the record. We wanted as little extraneous information as possible so that we could get right to that right resource because it was in one place and we had only one way to get there. But when we began to move to digital records and then digital items that we were moving to, suddenly why can't we represent 300 different cataloging schemas and different vocabularies and native taxonomies and folksonomies to begin to find these resources in a different way? It's a different way of thinking. What we're seeing is that integrated library systems are abandoning mark left and right. They'll output to it and they'll input to it, but they don't like it. They're moving to relational databases and object-oriented databases that they quickly can. And they're moving to Ferber, but Ferber is just an inch further than Mark, and it has about a day and a half's life worth. I'm just going to say it. We need to be moving to full text concepts. And that means that people who really began to define librarians as human cataloging of the, of the human record, we need to get over that. Our job is to facilitate learning. Our job is to use whatever tool it takes to help people get smarter. And once again, those tools, those books, those materials, they aren't necessarily right or wrong. We know that you know, there is no place more full of lies, mistakes, outright fabrications than a good academic library. We keep the mistakes so that the historians can follow them. We keep errors so that, so that researchers won't replicate them. We keep that record in such a way so that the answer, to a good answer to a good question may be a really bad resource. But in that context, it's the perfect one. And AI is going to get there, and it's hopefully going to get there with our help. I'm going to just sort of ignore this a little bit and jump ahead because I've been preaching too long. And what I want to do is I talk about competencies. I want to break this concept of AI and generative AI down into a bit of pieces because often people get a bit confused by them. You've got the data, right? This is what, what Marshall talked about being tokenized. The data being collected goes into the system. You've got algorithms, and those algorithms are take that data and figure out how to find the different facets to them, how to build deep learning systems, whether it has training or not, how you begin to tokenize this information. And then you finally have machine learning, which are the algorithms that build these neural networks and then come up with matching of queries and questions, generate guardrails, um, begin to understand use of language, things of this. At such a massive scale, it's almost unbelievable. Um, and so this is where we get terms like deep big data, algorithms, AI, deep learning, but they're really these three interlocking levels. And librarians have a role at each of these three interlocking levels. So let's break them down for a second. When you look at the kind of functions that librarians can bring to this field, in machine learning, how could we participate in the research? Once again, I look at this as an opportunity for AI not to sit back and wait for our scholars to develop the software and then for us to figure it out, but for us to work shoulder by shoulder with our scholars. The great opportunity of AI is not a better search, it's a better relationship. 
We can work with our English departments and our language departments and our Spanish departments and our history departments to talk about the use of these tools and set appropriate policy. We can also, as for example, University of Texas just began ta -da, their scholars lab, where it's a center where scholars can come in and use computing, use these tools, work with librarians to understand how to cite them, how to connect them, how to store their data over time, how to cite data. We talk about open access, we're not just longer talking about the articles, we're talking about the underlying data that's provided, and that's a whole new way of organizing materials, right? What do you do, what's a mark record for a 12 terabyte data set around astrological imaging, right? So in deep learning, we're sitting next to our scholars who are developing these algorithms, who are trying this software, or coming up with public examples, and we're working on training training for the scholars, training for the students, training for ourselves. We're working on the issue of hallucinations. We're working on the issues of identifying what data is not there and what in an algorithm drives it to create answers. We're ensuring diverse test sets to go into these systems for training. We're doing evaluation and ultimately we're there to provide transparency in this process. Transparency because the other thing that is very much a black box is that all of the commercial systems, and by the way, the academic systems as well, are building filters. When an answer goes out, they're building filters to prevent racist responses, to, pre to prevent sexist responses. They're doing their best to do false responses. That's what's currently not transparent and shared, and librarians can be part of bringing that out into the open. In data, we can work very much on creating diverse data sets that are representative of communities, not simply what's easily available, which is mostly middle-aged white guy and pictures thereof. Um, we can work on privacy, privacy models, privacy concepts. How do we set up privacy within these systems? How do we build those policies? Intellectual property, primarily through reform of intellectual property, once again, this is going to end up in court, and it's a great time for us to take a look at our um, copyright, patents, trademarks, all of those things, and rethink about their original purpose, which was not to make people rich. The original purpose of all of these intellectual property mechanisms was to get ideas into the common good that could be utilized, and maybe it's time we revisit that concept. Data stewards, data hygiene, ontology development, ontology development, ontology development. If you want to talk about a classic skill that is now in high demand, ontology development. And within algorithms, we talk about advocacy and explainable AI. Why did this post come up next? Why did this song get presented next? Why is this the top resources? And so then we can match to what skills do we need. And once again, I, the, our first speaker did a much better job and comprehensive job of these. So I'll just give you a few that I think are important. Project management skills and assessment skills. We don't think about librarians as project managers, but that's primarily what we do. A lot of logistics and assessment. Um, we're getting to the point of needing to talk about what, you know, what is the impact of an academic library towards student success? How much of their graduation how much of their degree is owed to the work of the library? How much of that research and the success of the research is owed to the library? We need to be able to have those skills. We need the skill at the data level, data literacy. We need to know what to do with an eight terabyte data set. We need to know about data hygiene and field strengths, how this is documented, how this is provided, ontology and taxonomy, policy and research skills. But here's the biggest one for me. What we really need to do is promote and build our sense of facilitation and community engagement. We need to take this as an opportunity to knock on the doors of every faculty member in our schools and say, hi, we know that we're dealing with a massive upshift in the knowledge infrastructure that you grew up with, that I grew up with, and these students are growing up with. I'm here to work with you to figure out how we do this most effectively. I know you're a humanities scholar and you're terrified that, that ChatGPT and generative AI is going to put writing in the trash bin. Let's have a conversation about how that can be preserved and what does it look like to assess that today. I know that you're in the sciences and you have been looking at how you can begin to automate your processes, but let's talk about the ethical side of this and ensure that when you're using laboratory experiments, we're still upholding human values within it. The bottom line to all of this, from my perspective, is that we must not treat AI as the latest thing to be cataloged. 
we must not try and take this remarkably new square peg and cram it as far as we can into a circular hole. This is our time to think big. We've gone through innovation and change. We've gone through personal computing, a telecommunications revolution, an internet revolution. We've moved to an internet of things revolution. We've moved to a massive data computing revolution. We've moved to a monetization of the data sphere. And now we're in AI and all that's happened within the past 20 years, now well, 40 years. It's coming fast and it's coming hard. And this is our chance to once again, reacquaint ourselves with why we're doing this reacquaint our value and rehold our value, and then to make that obvious. And our value has never been, I want to say this really clearly, we are unbiased and objective. Our value is we are very biased and very objective to things like open access, to things like transparency, to things like intellectual freedom, to things like freedom of expression. Those are not neutral values that we hold. Those are very, very, very much biases and values that we purport teach and try to instill. We must not, we must be the voice of the common good. This is good that these images I'm showing you are AI generated and they're all open and not in copyright at all. Take them, use them, play with them, do what you will with them. And yes, we need to make sure that they are representative and they are not using stereotypes and that they are ethically curated images for its creation. But that's once again, if we stand up and voice it and not wait and complain about it in journals to ourselves. How do we show up at our academic journals and the, the, the Society of Astronomers and the Society of Physics and the Society of Chemists and say, this is an area that we want to partner with you to figure out the primary and best public good that we can bring by utilizing these technologies. Our skills must continue to evolve, but not our values. Marshall's right. We are a profession of profound values. And those things that we have, have are important, but they're only important if they shape a community. They're only important if we act upon them. Our values are only important if they leave the building. This is a time that AI has given us to think very differently about authorship, to talk about research, to talk about quality, to talk about bias, to talk about all the things that we have felt core to our profession for 20 years. It's our time to get out of the building and say, this is what we've learned and let's partner to see how it works in your environment. Anyway, I appreciate your time um, and I'm going to shut up now because I think we might have time for questions. Uh, that one.